Thank you for joining us on our last series uh, on uh, uh, the events of Karbala and the morning rituals, our online discussions. Tonight, the topic of discussion is the Sunni perception of Shiite morning rituals. And we are delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Kumail Rajani, Sheikh Abdul Hadi Al Amri, Dr. Imran Hussein Khan from uh, Markfield. Sorry, I forgot to mention where they were from. Dr. Kumail from Exeter, Molana Abdul Hadi from Birmingham, uh, Dr. Imran from uh, Markfield. And later on, we'll, we will be joined by Sheikh Omar Ramadan from Manchester. Dr. Ali Reza Bojani will try and join us as well later on. And we have apologies from Mufti Abu Laith who couldn't make it. Uh, now, without further ado, Muharram is a very special time for the Shias, as is known by both the Sunnis and the Shias alike. However, what the Shias don't understand is how the Sunnis perceive the Shia morning rituals and what they understand them to be. Now, of course, within the morning rituals, we have the remembrance of Imam Hussein. We have orators lecturing on themes of morality, sociological, political, historical themes. Together with that, we have the elegy and eulogy of Imam Hussein. Sometimes there's expression of grief through the matam and the beating of the chest. And at other times, we have the recitation of our pious literature. Now, this is what Muharram is in a nutshell, and of course, accompanied by a lot of symbolism that seeks to draw the devotees towards Imam Hussein in his memory. Now, the Shia want to understand what are the Sunni perceptions of these morning rituals with its variety. Now, one thing needs to be clarified, that Sunni is not one set of understanding of Islam. It's a broad umbrella term, which includes within it many divisions. Just as Shia Islam, Shiaism is a broad umbrella term and which has at present some prominent divisions or factions such as Shia Twelvers, Shia Ismailis, Shia Bohras, Shia Zaydis. What makes them all Shias is their belief in the Imamat of Imam Ali and their belief that Imam Ali was the most eligible of, of the Prophet's companions to be his vicegerent and to succeed him immediately after him. That is the broad theological take that the Shias have or political take that they had back in the day. Whereas Sunnis broadly understand that Khalifa Abu Bakr was legitimately elected as the first Khalifa. However, within that, they have prominent divisions such as, for example, within the subcontinent community, the Barelwis, the Diobandis, the Ahlul Hadith. And I suppose we have the Sufi uh, Sunnis, which are a category that are possibly within the Barelwis and in and of themselves, just as they are within the Shias. With that now, Dr. Imran, I would like to ask you, what are the Sunni perceptions of the Shia morning rituals? You may just wish to take one angle of it or one aspect of it and we can come back and revert to you for maybe if you want to then add on the pious literature and recitation of the pious literature as opposed to the morning rituals and of course we have dr komail if we need any clarity from the shia side dr komail is here to respond from time to time i shall be placing questions to the panel as well dr imran First and foremost, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you for having us here. It's a pleasure to be among such distinguished and learned people. Um, it's an honor. And uh, obviously is in discussing this map, we obviously understand the sensitivities around it. Uh, so when we discuss, it's not really a criticism or an attempt to denigrate the history of um, Shiism in any, any form whatsoever. But it's just a question to critically reflect on tradition itself and to understand better from a Sunni perspective as to these uh, morning rituals. Um, if we go back, I suppose, into history and really start right at the back, at the start, 
the origin, the inception um, of, of, say, uh, well, the, the practice during Muharram itself, we see that the episode that what happened, you know, uh, at Karbala, there are several, you know, accounts and versions of that, but the officially sort of accepted, broadly accepted version is that, uh, of course, Imam Hussein was martyred, and it's, uh, it's a terrible event. Um, it's a terrible event. It's, it's something that I suppose not only the Shia will mourn, but we as, you know, if we call ourselves Sunnis in that, in, in that respect, we also see it as a great tragedy in our history. So I think the first thing for us to clarify is that actually this tragic event is not just um, confined to what we understand to be the Shia sect or the Shia oh. Islam. This is actually something which spans right across uh, the whole Islamic um, understanding. So it, it's something which impacts all of us. And if we look back at that time, our first real sort of critical reflection is that as we look upon that period, we see that Imam Hussein travels um, towards say, Kufa because he's been called to lead a, a revolt against this Umayyad dynasty. Um, and I'm not here to defend the Umayyads in any way, of course. I'm just saying that they, they, you know, they, there's, there's an opportunity to lead a revolt. It's a populist revolt amongst the Shia sect. He's traveling. He's traveling with his sister, Zainab. He's traveling with his infant daughter. He's traveling with his sons. And then he's traveling with a small retinue, a small army of bodyguards to look after him. So the first question arises as to why he traveled you know, in such a manner, a light manner, unguarded manner, in such a volatile and you know, uh, hostile situation context where they were attacked, of course, um, as they reached the south bank of the Euphrates in, in the place of Karbala, they were pretty much prevented from reaching the banks. They were you know, almost starved, they were thirsty, they were, they, they were encamped. And eventually, of course, we know that you know, on the 10th of Muharram, uh, well, from the 2nd to the 10th of Muharram and the Shura on the 10th, we see the, the unfortunate and tragic events that took place and then what happened to the remaining family, which was you know, humiliated and taken to Damascus. So that kind of history, we all agree on. So there is a great tragedy for us to reflect upon. We agree on that fact. But then we start to ask questions as to why a man of such stature um, would travel in such a fashion, knowing the dangers and hostilities that he faced. And in traveling in that manner, obviously he faced, you know, uh, he faced a perilous journey anyway through the deserts. Uh, but what happens then is that He's, very, you know, he's unprepared. And so we're wondering, why is he so unprepared? And we kind of then look to the Islamic history and the scholars of the time to give us some sort of answers. And we read people like uh, Tabiri in the 10th century, some 300 years later, who writes quite comprehensively on, on, on the early Islamic history, at least. It's quite an authoritative account. And he also questions. He says, why did this happen? Why did he travel? He knew the danger that he was about to face. And we know that at that time, Ibn Aqil, his envoy was... Uh, taken by Abdullah bin Ziyad, um, the governor of Kufa. He was murdered. The Shia uprising happened. They didn't, were obviously subjected to what they were subjected to. But then afterwards, there's no real, I think, within history, and please correct me, my sort of distinguished guests on the other side, there's no real explanation as to why this happened or what the thinking was behind that until we get very much later into um, sort of 15th, 16th century. Uh, and then we see from the sort of Shia side, they, their authoritative accounts, which then try and justify um, as to why he did such a thing. And the accounts that we come across are to the fact that he, um, there, there, there was a kind of a divine providence involved in this. Hussein was, uh, he, he already knew he was predestined to become a martyr. His family, Fatma, radiallahu uh, her, she was aware of the fact of about what was about to transpire. And so it was a real sacrifice for the bigger common good. Their sacrifice would actually instill some sort of awakening in the Muslims who would realize how you know, evil and cruel the Umayyads were. In the 16th century, uh, Majlisi, I think a very famous and prominent writer, writes on the account, and then he starts to discuss this in much more sort of uh, providential terms where he's discussing things like um, the fact that he was predestined already in you know, pre-creation. Uh, Hussein had been selected amongst the pious people. He, Angel Jibreel, had come down with the, the cup of suffering from which he had taken the last sip 
guaranteeing his martyrdom upon earth, therefore guaranteeing that he could intercede on behalf of humanity and the sinful so that they would you know, be saved and, and, and salvaged. So this is really the account that we see, and it really comes down in the mid 15th, 16th centuries before that. What I'd like to add is actually the notion of Sunnism and Shiaism isn't as fixed, the, 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 the um, fixed traditions that we see today aren't in that same form at that time as they are now. So there is a big political influence at that time. We know the Ottomans are ruling um, in, in, towards the West, the battle of uh, Iraq essentially, and there's the Safavid Empire, Empire which has come up. So within the Safavid Empire, we see that there is this notion or need to develop an identity, a separate identity, which can counter the Ottoman idea. So we see the start of the literature on all the intercessions. So critically reflecting back on the period, we are wondering as to why this discussion on the intercessionary period didn't happen. And it didn't happen to the later period because our understanding then becomes that there is a need to reinforce an identity, to create a new stance which eventually gives rise to what we see Shiism today, and especially these morning rituals, which become a part of the theological makeup. Well, th th thank you for that uh, very elaborate <coughs> take on the whole issue, and then to put the whole matter from a Sunni perspective in the context that you have. I would like to, uh, by the way, welcome uh, Sheikh Muhammad uh, Ramadan, who has just uh, joined us now. Uh, but now I want to, now given that that is there, and Dr. Komail may want to come back uh, to that, I just want to go to uh, Molana Hadi and to ask now, how do the Sunnis view the Shia morning rituals as they stand right now within, let's say, the subcontinent? Assalamu <clears throat> alaikum warahmatullahi Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa man tabi'ahu bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin Amma ba'd Thank you very much I would like to thank to the organizer of this program MashaAllah uh, This is one of the source to remove misconception or confusion or wrong information because this is fundamental issue that we don't try to take knowledge and information from reliable sources, Sunni and Shia equally, because they trust on rumors more than they are trying to get knowledge from reliable sources or personalities. We are not talking here about what Rakir they are saying from Shia a point of view, are wise from Ahlul Sunnah point of view. Because mostly wise and Zakir, we have to remember one point that their main purpose may be to raise up emotions of people. And they don't rely on proper knowledge, mostly. So like, for example, in Muharram, what happened in Pakistan, we, there is a, many, a, a important lesson for us to learn that a Zakir who used to take 40,000 rupees according to a Shia Alim in Pakistan who said, uh, this is on TV, that he used to charge for one majlis 40,000 rupees, but after swearing some Sahaba, and what happened in Pakistan, his fees gone up and he now charging 100,000 rupees per majlis. If this is our aim, to achieve some material benefit, some dunya, to get some dunya, so this type of thing can happen. So what happened in Pakistan, like abusive language against one another, to point where groups are labeling each other as a kafir, as a kafir, clearly they are saying as a kafir, while we all believe that we are Muslim, we believe in oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, also we believe Sunni and Shia, 
that finality of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He is the final messenger, and also we believe that Quran revealed as a book of guidance for all, as a final book. Quran and Majid revealed, and also we believe that we are answerable to Allah subhanahu wa taala on day of judgment. But still, we are saying this, and we are talking about each other against each other. Not simple or light words, but even we are saying that they are kafir. So here, uh, I would like to emphasize on few points. Like for example, who is the role model for us, especially to show our mourning and sadness, how we are going to behave and how we are going to react. Like for example, in Surah Al-Ahzab, where's Twenty-one. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala saying, "لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا." There is a great uswa example to be followed that in the life of Prophet Alayhi Salatu was Salam, and what he did, like when his son died, Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu was Salam. So our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He came, and what was his personal situation that time? According to authentic hadith, and all Sunni and Shia, they all agreed upon this. Inna al-ayna tadma, wal qalba yahzun, wala naqulu illa ma yarda Rabbuna, wa inna bi faraqika la mahzunun. Although tears were coming from the eyes of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he was very sad and upset, but he said that. We are not going to say anything which is not appropriate for true believer. This is the Sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and also Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam strongly prohibited to react in negative way as it was tradition in Jahiliya, according to authentic sources like Laysa minna man darab al khudud wa shak al juyub wa daa. Bidawal Jahiliya, like beating and uh, weeping, these all not from our Sharia, but in Muharram, some they are doing in public domain as well, which is not appropriate according to Shia school of thought. I am talking about Maslak and Madhab. I am not talking what is going on. In public domain and uh, as a culture, uh, culture people, what they are doing, but like many scholars in Shia, like Marja and Mujtahid in Iraq, as well as in Qum in Iran in general, they are saying this is not acceptable practice to bleeding himself and to showing like this type of thing. And the name of mourning, which is not acceptable, because this is to give wrong impact, especially against Shia school of thought. Because if you do like this type of thing in front of people, what message you want to give to others? And rather this, if we do like uh, about the importance of Muharram, for example. This can be because Muharram is the first month from Islamic calendar. This can be source to unite Muslim equally, Ahlu Sunna and Ahlu Shia, because to respect Ahlu Bayt, this is part of our Iman according to Ahlu Sunna. I am not saying this is mustahab. I am not saying this is wajib. I am saying this is part of Iman. If any Sunni does not respect Ahlul Bayt, he does not consider himself as a Muslim. So we have to respect them, and we have to give them honor, because Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mentioned this in Quran, as well as there are many authentic hadiths relating to this title. So we have to show. Uh, our respect towards them, and also what they did, qurbani, sacrifice, and they have 
set up a marvelous example to be followed those who are coming later on sacrifice of their everything wealth hometown family members everything so we can make this month as a month of like uh, unity for uh, muslim umma but what happened for example in pakistan and also many other part of the world like in the month of muharram about swearing of or uh, using abusive language against sahaba and ummuhatul mu'minin wives of prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and even shi'i scholars and many ulama reliable ulama and famous ulama they strongly and categorically prohibited this and even there even there is a fatwa saying that uh, don't curse and don't swear ummuhatul mu'minin wives of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and famous companion like khulafa uh, and for example dua of chahlum now mostly people maybe after two days or three days they are going to do this my question here will be from where we have got to those uh, shia, shia ulama our brothers so from where they have got this dua is this in quran e majid or is this from sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam to curse namely on few sahaba and if you say like this so there will be reaction as well and that reaction may be uh, very huge or whatever but from where this dua so here my few points number 1 about the significant of the month of muharram but how we are using this is number 1 and second about like insulting of some companion of prophet and wives of prophet although this is not from the teaching of shia but from where this came and third point matam mourning in the month of muharram in a way which is not acceptable even according to shia school of thought so from where this came and why people they emphasize on this and ulama shia ulama those who are mashallah very knowledgeable and they have very good skill but because of some reason they don't want to say in front of people maybe they have compromised with the cultural issues and values or whatever reason but they don't want to say for example in dua of chahlo they don't stop according to my knowledge and information this is not in quran and this is not in a, a confirm sunnah of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam but still it is ongoing practice so here i think mix up between culture and islamic teaching if we emphasize on islamic teaching from both sides sunni and shia so we can minimize uh, these distance and we can reduce differences between um, ourselves and we can be together inshallah taala but some ulama mashallah those who have skill they should come and say openly what is right yeah, th- th- thank you for that very comprehensive presentation uh, dr komail <clears throat> uh, i would by the way we welcome dr alirza bojani who has uh, been able to join us now so two questions have come up Dr Imran he is asking that there was no such thing as Shia Islam with its own identity the story of Imam Hussein was a very simple story and we do not even understand what details are to be found in that story in a way that we can historically say that this is authentic or the historicity of it is not doubtful in addition Dr Imran made a <clears throat> point that it seems in order to create an identity for themselves the safawid introduced the morning rituals within shia islam 
joined it with the days of Imam Hussein and that became an identity for Shia Islam. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, to both uh, Dr. Imran and Amolan Abdul Hadi for that candid opinion. And um, there is a lot to unpack over here uh, because we have been listening for the last 25 minutes and it would be difficult for me to address one by one. Uh, so kindly please help me uh, in reminding if I'm missing uh, something. Starting with uh, uh, Dr. Imran's uh, submission as far as uh, uh, Sunni point of view is concerned that sometimes our Sunni uh, sisters and brothers find it difficult to understand um, why this massacre or this tragedy, this event occurred in the first place. And politically speaking, whether Imam Hussein uh, and his companions were in preparation or like, you know, uh, they, well, Dr. Imran didn't say this, but I'm just like uh, trying to understand. There was a political miscalculation from the uh, from from Imam Hussein's side uh, that he made uh, that miscalculation uh, and then end up having this tragedy. So to reply this, um, we could think of like uh, three principal reasons why uh, this tragedy occurred, uh, and then I would move on to the second part of the question, which uh, Sheikh Arif just asked me about the Shiism and, and Safid story. So the three principal reasons which you find is, is and by the way, the the things which uh, we are narrating is coming from um, uh, Tabari, uh, the great jurist. Um, uh, um, well, he is quoting from Abu Mekhnaf and so on and so forth. So the chain of transmitters um, and, and the narrations which we receive are in fact from Sunni sources because th th there were no that sort of like Shi'i sources in, in that early uh, centuries. So that's from Tabari as well as uh, Ibn Saad's uh, Tabakat. Um, and then we have from Baladuri and Sabul Ashraf, so on and so forth. We could always argue about, you know, um, the chains of transmission as well as the, the, the reliability of, of, of Akhbaris, because in those days, historians were um, supposedly called as, as Akhbaris. But what I want to say is like, you know, the sources which uh, these histories is narrated is something which is coming from uh, largely coming from Sunni sources. So three principal reasons which comes to mind. Number one, um, again, uh, quoted from Tabari uh, that um, mm -hmm. the Amir of Sham, um, after like, you know, uh, Moavia, we have Yazid. And Yazid asked for uh, the Pledge of Allegiance uh, through his governor in Medina. Uh, so what was um, Hussein supposed to do uh, in terms of uh, this Pledge of Allegiance? On the one side, um, he might have think uh, to pledge the allegiance, but then that goes uh, against the ethos of uh, the very Islam, because uh, he wanted to uh, follow the Sunnah of, of the Holy Prophet, of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi uh, and, and, and it would go against those ethos and those values which he was brought up with. So that was the first thing that Yazid pledged the allegiance from him. Yazid asked for the allegiance from uh, Hussein and Hussein refused to pay allegiance on the grounds that Yazid was not uh, someone whom we should pay allegiance. Earlier we know Imam Ali worked with, with Khulafa. Um, Imam Ali worked with the first and the second caliph to the extent he provided his his mashwara, but working with, with um, Yazid was like next to impossible because um, he would think like, you know, that goes against the principle of Quran and, and, and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. So that's the first thing. The second reason why this massacre or this tragedy happened is, as Dr. Imran mentioned, that Kufans wrote letters and this is the Kufa where um, these people have experienced the life of Ali uh, who fought against Muawiyah and we have like, you know, the Battle of Sifin, uh, which we all know. Um, and then because these Kufans had that sort of understanding that Banu Umayyah were going against the principles of Islam and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. Um, uh, and, and you see uh, Yazid, son of Muawiyah, and at this time uh, you, you see Hussein, son of Ali. So here you see the same thing, Ali against Muawiyah, and here you see Hussein against uh, Yazid. So uh, the sentiments were very clear that if we allow Umayyads to rule the Muslim Ummah, then that is going to be resulting in a huge disaster. 
the sunnah of the prophet the authentic sunnah of the prophet would be diluted would be compromised because the essence of islam used to be in medina or like kufa where many companions were there not in sham where there were less companions and more of like you know um, uh, that known islamic uh, practices so that was the second reason uh, when kufan wrote the letters uh, imam felt that obligation to go and to respond despite the fact hussein knew uh the kufans not all of them were quite good and 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 uh, that was not a rocket science for hussein because hussein had experience first handed in kufa while he was with ali we know like you know what happened after the battle of sifin uh, the people like from the camps of imam ali were against him because not all the kufans were shi's because there were elitist uh, group of uh, individuals who were against uh, in the camp of ali but against uh, ali so the hussein was quite familiar that what is going on in kufa but then there were always good people in kufa as well like companions of the holy prophet as well as companion of uh, the first caliph and the second caliph and the third caliph and uh, imam ali so you you have this kufans writing the letter and imam felt that obligation to move towards understanding that this is not going to result in a good uh, conclusion uh, number 3 um and and we have been told through separate narrations and this by the way the third concept which i am trying to uh, present here this doesn't come from the sunni sources uh, it comes from the shi'i sources um not authentic but the gist of um the, the campaign of hussein is quite clear and in in one of the the narrations he mentioned inni lam akhruj ashran wala bat i have not come out of this medina simply for the fact to create this unity or discord in the, within the muslim ummah rather my only intent to come out of medina is a'muru bil ma'ruf wa anhar al munkar wa asiru bi sirati jaddi and um, in, interestingly uh, you have like you know in in, uh, uh, in in some of the text asiru bi sirati jaddi wa khulafa rashidin i want to follow the footstep of holy prophet and the khulafa well in shi sources we don't have but in in some sunni sources we have this uh, thing which is very clear that you know the whole mission is to revive islam to uh, alert people to follow the islam of uh, madanis and kufans not something coming from damascus or something coming from the omara so these are the three principal reasons and and it's not just like you know first or second or third it could be blended and come up with this is the popular shi'i narrative uh, which uh, shi'is would like to give and present why hussein uh, came up out of this medina coming back to the second part of uh, dr imran's um, uh, the submission as well as what sheikh arif asked me uh, about uh, the safid uh, thing uh, certainly i would concur partially with um, uh, dr imran's um, analysis uh, that from the safid uh, period we have like many sort of uh, things which were not supposed to be in the first place for example uh, muhakkikar ki the grand jurist uh, majlis he comes much later he died in um 10 um 11 11 10 or 11 11 right towards the, the uh, beginning of the 12th century after hijra let's go early safid period uh, 1500 uh, common era you have muhakkikar ki and he writes a book nafahatul lahut fi lane al jibt wa taghut um unfortunately uh, a big uh, sort of mistake Uh, Safir coming into existence and writing books on cursing on the first and the second caliph, which is not something which um, uh, Shias would condone. Let's go pre-Safir period. You have Shahid Ulawal and Shahid Athani. They were nurtured and they were trained under the Sunni ulama, and and uh, you, you you see the writings of them quite influenced by the Sunni school of thought, and 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 the teachers were Sunni. They had very good relations, and and so on and so forth. So Safid history is is a pivotal uh, period where we find uh, some of the innovations. But as far as Azadari is concerned, also as far as his morning rituals are concerned, um, I would say it goes back much much earlier. let's say um, after the, the 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 period of imams right um we have like in baghdad in baghdad giant scholars such as tusi mufi said murtaza said razi so all of these people in their works we have um proper narrations a submission um that the the the, the lamentation the 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 tragedy of of karbala was being remembered very heavily um let's go to kum 
in early 4th century after Hijra. You have Saduq, you have Ibn Wali, you have um, uh, likes of Muhammad Ibn Isa al-Ashari, you have Kulaini, his teacher. Again, heavily um, she influence you see in, um, in, in early 4th century. Um, and uh, the sort of like mourning rituals and lamentations, those things were well established. After the Baghdad period, you see Hilla, right? Um, after 460, after um, Hijra. In Hilla, you again see like likes of Sayyidina Ta'us, uh, like Ibn Idris, uh, like uh, um, uh, Sayyid Ibn, Ta uh, Ibn Numal Hilli. So Hilla school of thought, again, you have sources suggesting that uh, the mourning of um, the rituals of, of uh, commemoration of Imam Hussein was always there. And the common theme, which we see across Qum, Baghdad and Hilla, and then Jabal Amil before Safi. So these four areas which I'm, I'm discussing is, is pre safi era. The common theme which we see is for Shiites, I mean for scholars, always you could look at like, you know, laity and common populace. But for Shi ulama, the thing is that the authentic Islam, the Sirat of the Prophet, which we could find we find in the Sirat of Hussein because Hussein is someone who is reviving the Sunnah of the Prophet. Because if Hussein had not martyred, or if he had not given the sacrifice, we would have forget the Sunnah of the Prophet. We would have forgotten the Quran. So he is seen from the Shi'i point of view. He is seen someone who is who is, who is going to to uh, bring uh, that spirit of of Islam. Uh, so it won't be fair to say that, you know, the entire mourning rituals would come from the Safid period. However, I would say two points over here. Number one, yes, cursing and bashing that comes from the Safid period. Um, uh, and and uh, the, the certain types of exaggerated rituals of like, you know, um, uh, violent sort of aggressive sort of uh, or radical sort of things. Yes, that comes from the Safid period as well. But as far as mourning rituals is concerned, was consistent across um, uh, different schools, uh, as I mentioned before, well before uh, Safed. Uh, coming back to Maulana Abdul Hadi Sahab, now I would start with uh, the, the definition of Shia, and it's very interesting, which Aban bin Taglib mentions. Uh, yeah. I'm going to uh, go to Dr. Bojani yeah. to offer this response. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive response. Uh, Dr. Uh, <coughs> Ali Raza, uh, Mulan Abdul Hadi, whilst saying that Imam Hussein is revered by all of us, Sunni and Shia, and Sunni and Shia ought to come together and commemorate or celebrate in the name of Hussein ibn Ali, and to the extent he was implying that we revive our faith through the remembrance of Hussein ibn Ali, then nobody can deny the position of Hussein ibn Ali. They are the family of the Prophet, and the Quran commands us to have love and belonging with the family of the Prophet. Then he said that the Shia scholars, the grand Ayatollahs are saying one thing. The Zakirin are saying something else. Here he spoke about three areas which are problematic. One is, he said, where do we get these rituals of matam and beating our chests? Whereas the Blessed Prophet said, do not cry in the way that the pagans cry and lament their dead. Cry in a dignified manner and remember them. It has no basis in the Quran or Sunnah of the Blessed Prophet. So where does it come from? Two, he stated, Dua Chahlum, which I assume what Mulana Sab meant was the cursing contained in some of our ziyarat. Where does that cursing come from of the Sahaba? Three, he's talking about the Zakirin cursing the Khalifa and the wives of the Prophet. And why do the Grand Ulama not take a firm stand against this, despite saying that it shouldn't be done and knowing that it is being done? Dr. Bojani. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And so, uh, uh, similarly to uh, Sheikh Kumail's comment, you know, both speakers have given us very rich comments and detailed comments. Um, so I'll do my best to um, respond or comment on a few of those um, on a few of those issues. I think firstly, I wanted to echo Sheikh Abdul Hadi's comments about the potential, not just the potential, actually, the reality that the remembrances which occur within Muharram over the centuries and currently okay, have actually contributed 
you know, to revival of the um, love of Ahlul Bayt, okay, and strengthening the Iman of Muslims more generally, and bringing out some of those beautiful messages of, of, of Islam. But in terms of some of the specific questions which he raised, um, I think it's very, very important to recognize, um, and I will come back to this, that there is diversity, you know, with, amongst Shias. And there's also a diversity of methods, you know, amongst Muslims. So um, Shias, and actually Muslims per se, don't necessarily ground every, the value of every act directly and explicitly in the Quran and Sunnah. So typically, Shias will point to the general permissibility. Okay, in fact, the general impetus or the explicit impetus for remembrance of Ahlul Bayt, for expressions of love of Ahlul Bayt, so on and so forth. Now, as Sheikh Kumail has pointed out, okay, these practices of mourning have evolved over time, and there's no doubt about that. Of course, some would feel that that isn't necessarily a problem. Okay, there is value, okay, in human expressions. Others, of course, do have a problem from within the Shia tradition about the limits of such practices. But I think to speak about the internal diversity here, okay, won't serve the purpose of what we're aiming for, but just to remind ourselves that look, if we flatten all Muslim practice, I'm not talking about all Shia practice, all Muslim practice, to the explicit teachings or the explicit expressions, okay, within the Quran and Sunnah, Islam would look very, very different today. Okay, and many Muslims, okay, would lose, okay, their means of affinity with the teachings of the Prophet. Okay, their means of affinity with the Ahlul Bayt. Now, we can disagree about those methods. Okay, but the reality is there is diversity in the way Muslims are practiced have always practiced, and how they have grounded their practice. Now, in terms of some of the problems which um, Sheikh Abdul Hadi highlighted about the four particular forms, for example, of ma'atham, or the cursing, if we come to the cursing in particular, now I would absolutely agree. And he's pointed to this himself, that there are Shia ulama who have flatly rejected, described it as haram, okay, to say that the cursing of the khunafa okay, is haram, the cursing of Hazrat Aisha, okay, is haram. But on the other hand, we also know that this isn't the comprehensive view of Shias. And I think we have to acknowledge that. For me personally, of course, I would endorse the view that this is impermissible and goes against the ethics of the Ahlul Bayt themselves. So if I just give you an example of a khutbah, from um, attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib himself, which we find in the Nahj al-Balaga, okay, and where Imam Ali was passing by some of his companions, okay, during the Battle of Safin. So this isn't in remembrance of what was happening at Safin. This was during the Battle of Safin, where there was actually a war going on between Imam Ali and his people on one side and Bani Umayyah led by Muawiyah on the other side. Now, Imam Ali is reported to have been passed by some of his companions who were cursing the people of Sham, okay, who were doing sub of the people of Sham. Imam Ali's response, according to that which is recorded in Nahj al when you find it in some other earlier sources like Dinawari, for example, he said, Inni akrahu lakum an takunu sababi. He said, I hate for you. He was telling his own people, while they were in a situation of war, so they're actually fighting against the people of Muawiyah. Imam Ali is reported to have said, I hate for you, I dislike for you to be amongst the people who curse. He said, if only you had mentioned the characteristics of those other people. So criticize them. Tell us what's wrong with their actions. But don't be amongst the people who curse. You know, the hadith continues, the tradition continues. I won't read it out for in, the, in the interest of time. But we see ultimately Imam Ali telling his people, according to this report, why don't you pray for our reconciliation? It would be better that you, instead of cursing them, you pray for our reconciliation and you pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects our blood and their blood. 
Now, I think this is very, very important for us, this ethic. Of course, the Shias would make a distinction between La'an and Sab, but I don't want to go there. Okay, but I think this ethic of Imam Ali is very, very important in echoing a comment with, uh, which Sheikh Abdul Hadi meant and mentioned, which the perception is important. Okay, the perception of the practices of the Shia is important. The Shias are seeking to revive their attachment to Imam Hussein and revive the teachings of the Prophet directly. But in that process, we should be very, very conscious of its impact. And ultimately, it seems to me that the ethics of the Ahlul Bayt were to seek to bring people together despite diversity. Now, on that point, I will, I will make this my final point. You know, is I think there's a further problem which we must speak about here. Mm. Is that Muslims per se have a problem with diversity and difference. Okay, whether that's internal Shia difference and diversity, or whether that's among Sunnis, we could mention Ahl al Hadith, Diyabandi, Brewi, Sheikh Arif, gave us these introductions at the beginning, or whether it's amongst a humankind per se. I think we have to get past a point where I acknowledge not everybody's going to agree with me. Okay, and these differences should not be the basis for takfir. And the problem with takfir is that ultimately it's leading to giving permissibility, according to many Muslims across the board, for the spilling of blood. So beyond the practices, okay, the problems with cursing, Muslims, I'm not saying Shia, I'm not saying Sunni, Muslims, we have a problem with difference and diversity. If you don't agree with me, Okay, why? Okay, I don't agree with me. Why is this taking us to takfir? Why is this taking us to the spilling of blood? And actually, maybe we should be using the voice of Ahlul Bayt, okay, to actually resolve this. Because frankly, I think humans have bigger problems today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bojani. Now, but one question remained unanswered. Now, either one of you two, before I uh, ask uh, our dear Sheikh, uh, uh, Muhammad Ramadan to join us and to hear from him. But one question that uh, Molana Hadi asked remains unanswered. And that is that there are duas, I think he meant ziyarat, in which there is official form of cursing. And he pointed out that in Pakistan, the recent tensions that we witnessed were due to two things. A speaker who was paid quite a handsome price, he went and declared Khalifa Abu Bakr Kafir. And then after that, a cursing incident was transmitted. And that led to sectarian tension, eruption of sectarian tension. Now, obviously taking on board whatever you have said, but the question still remains that uh, Molana Hadi asked if such a dua or ziyarat, I assume he meant, is not contained within the Quran, where does it come from? Any one of you two may choose to answer that. Yeah, I, I'm just uh, trying to give rest to Dr. Ariza who has spoken uh, so uh, nicely. Uh, so yeah, so it, it goes back to some of the factions of uh, people which we had in Kufa uh, in, in uh, mid second century after Hijra during the times of Imams. Uh, and this is reported in, 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 in a Saduq, um, in his El Al-Sharai, when um, Abu Hanifa, as well as Jafar bin Muhammad al-Sadiq, so they had an encounter, and here, like, uh, Imam al-Sadiq uh, is, like, you know, having a conversation with Abu Hanifa. And then what happens is, like, uh, Abu Hanifa respects Imam al-Sadiq, saying, like, you know, some people in Kufa, they curse, like, you know, the, the, the Khodafa. So the Imam says, no, I have never asked them to do such things. He said, would you be willing to write a letter because people would obey uh, and, and hear, listen to your words. The Imam says, yes, I, I can. But the issue is like they don't listen to me. Right. So there is a faction of people. There is a group of people uh, who claim themselves to be Shias, but then Imam have rejected them that they are not my Shias whether you could call them Golat or you could call them, you know, um, uh, some exaggerators or like, you know, whatever extremist. So Imams have always set them apart from this faction of people who were there altogether towards like, you know, early fourth century. 
uh, some of them uh, who used to curse like um, the companions of the prophet and would say like you know um, that, that is the highest of korobat which imams rejected it and imam said that's not appropriate that's that does not uh, seem consistent with our teachings so then you come to a saduk who says like you know may allah curse those people who add things in the religion right so you you always had uh, imams as well as scholars who would refute and take position as well as maulana abdul hadi mentioned the contemporary scholars do the same thing but the problem is people don't listen to them and for that reason we need to make a clear distinction when it comes to speakers orators or or scholars there are scholars who have like you know done a good number of years of their studies they have uh, written the books they have read the books uh, they have a sound understanding but then we have unfortunately in indian subcontinent and uh, the different parts of the world as well who are orators they make money out of these things they are more of entertainers as opposed to researchers or opposed to uh, propagators or preachers they are propaganda uh, propagandists right so uh, as you mentioned like you know the fact they are trading they see commercial value in such things uh, they want to take money less and more based on what they want to deliver it shows that they are not scholars so that is the distinction which we needs to make um this distinction needs to come from the shi scholars and i'm glad to say like like so mohdis nuri in early 20th century in our contemporary world like mutahari and other scholars have written against the zakiri but unfortunately as we say uh, they don't listen uh, and and she community needs to do hard work in terms of setting their foot uh, firm and rejecting all these orators who are good for nothing but to create disunity amongst uh, muslim umma which goes against the teachings of the imams oh uh, thank you dr komel now you do know my own style the question needs to be answered yes it needs to be answered diplomacy and wonderful responses are in their own place the question was where did this dua come from which du- which dua the molana hadi said dua chehlum which i think he meant the ziyara in which there is official cursing uh, i think i assume ziyarat e ashura i want you to think on that uh, whilst we bring in uh, sheik umar Uh, I, I I would like to reply here in a very uh, brief manner, um, uh, but we need to confirm: uh, is he referring to the dua chalu? Because there is nothing such as the dua chalu. Um, yeah. And if he's re- um, referring to ziyarat ashura, we have discussed in length uh, as far as ziyarat ashura is concerned. We have concluded in our meeting. We had like different opinion, but I have very open in my uh, submission as well as like some early scholars like Hadi Marifat and and uh, many other scholars have said this. that you know cursing uh, khulafa rashidin is not accepted that's not part of ziyarat ashura that is an addition which have been made uh, we do not subscribe to it that's very clear which we have discussed and 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 we can go back to that uh, recording uh, as far as banu umayya is concerned the shi position is clear that banu umayya uh, they were not khulafa rather they were umara and they were institutionalizing some uh, issues which were not consistent with the teachings of quran or the prophet or the companions of the prophet so for that reason um, that is how ziyarat ashura would work so uh, molana hadi sahab thank you uh, dr komail the answer dr komail gave was that that part of the cursing is not acknowledged to be a part of that ziyara by the ulama of the shia so then your question was well why this disparity between the ulama and the zakirin and i will ask uh, some more clarity afterwards but just to point out that we will we will run over time we will go over time and we need to hear from our dear beloved sheikh umar ramadan before that ali raza please carry on i think in the as you say there's no need for diplomacy and sheikh abdul hadi al umri has requested saying the value of these forums that we can be very open with each other so i think it's also important to just point out that for the vast the popular understanding despite what sheikh kumail has just said the popular understanding is that the ziyarat ashura is attributed to the imams of ahlul bayt okay so the popular and despite what sheikh kumail has said 
about the, the a certain section of this dua, okay, which indirectly, okay, and places la'an, okay, on the first to oppress Ali Muhammad, the second to oppress Ali Muhammad, the third to oppress Ali Muhammad, yes, so on and so forth, in that language, first, second, third, okay? So there's innuendo here. Okay, so that section Sheikh Kumail is saying is not, a sound, is not soundly attributed to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. However, the popular understanding, okay, is that this ziyara is attributed to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. So I think it's important that, um, you know, we acknowledge that. Um, as you say, in the light of, um, you know, us being very straightforward with each other and very open. Sheikh Kumail has his view, yeah, and for me, even if this is soundly attributed to the Ahlul Bayt, the ethics of the Ahlul Bayt, which I pointed to, mean it's un unbefitting to be used in such a manner, okay, as it's being used in the contemporary situation and as we saw in Pakistan. So Sheikh Kumail was drawing our attention back to the debate we had a couple of nights ago, in which we, we had to acknowledge that we cannot source the entirety of the Ziyarat Ashura from the Imam. And then we found internal inconsistencies within the text itself, which made it very clear that the fifth Imam did not recite it himself. And there are further historical inconsistencies within it that we didn't have the time to explore. But we can say it's popularly understood, but we have no evidence to validate its origination from the Imam. Uh, Sheikh uh, Ramavan, are you with us? Sheikh Muhammad uh, Ramadan. Uh, yes, Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Salam alaikum. Please, lovely to have you as always. Thank My you. dear brother, if you could, uh, as, I, as I said to our viewers, we are going over time now and it was expected that we would. Could we have your thoughts around the perceptions of the Ahlus Sunnah around the morning rituals? Majority, a lot of it has been covered by um, Dr. Imran and uh, Adi Amri, but we also have a parallel within the Sunni Barelwi school of thought, like the sort of commemorations we have in uh, Shiaism. We have something similar to that within the Barelwi camp as well. It would be lovely to hear your thoughts. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Thank you very much for uh, organizing this much-needed program where we can share uh, certain views with each other. Uh, it's the Sunni perspective of Shiite. Uh, morning rituals. Uh, I mean, I mean, first, I mean, the first thing I would say is that Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he doesn't belong to Sunni Zoshial, he belongs to Islam in its totality. And what we've done is we have, I believe personally, we have an identity crisis here in the West and even in the Muslim world. We want to identify who we are and we want to identify ourselves to a certain form of understanding that we would be, for example, privileged with or we would accept. And I think that is a major problem that we find, that identity crisis we have in the Muslim world, that debate and so forth. One of the things I've, I've, I've been very adamant about is the issue of not tolerance, I don't accept that word, but the word understanding, having understanding of other people's rituals and ways and, 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 and so forth. One of the things I do say, is that we should not call for uniformity, that you should, for example, compromise on your beliefs, that you should compromise on your qaid, and you shouldn't hide them. You should be able to bring them forward and be able to debate with them on an academic way. However, what I would say is that this concept of knowing what, for example, Shias do during the commemoration of remembering the martyrdom of Imam Ali Maqam, alayhi salatu wasalam, one of the things that I observed was specifically in Iraq, the Arba'in March is now a multi-religious march, multi-diversity. That not only Shias are walking and are doing Ziyaratul, uh, you know, Ashura and so forth, but you've got Christians, Jews, Hindus, people of no faith, all of them, uh, you know, you know, falling in the footsteps and and and, and learning about the rituals of Imam Hussein. Now, if we advocate that we want that type of tolerance and diversity within the Muslim community and within the Muslim world, then we have to look seriously towards terminologies and seriously look towards provocative term, terms or wordings that are used 
that would put people off. Swearing at someone is one thing, sabab, but cursing someone and then cursing those individuals who are, who are held in high esteem by the majority of the Muslims around the world, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wa Umar and Uthman and so forth, Sayyidah Aisha salamu alayha, this is extremely provocative. And I think this is one of the things that I do have in contention with the Shia or Shia brothers. This, uh, I, I know, like you've said, the scholars have a difference of opinion. But what I'm saying in the 21st century, the scholars must be more open. And like we condemn takfir, we condemn the killing of any Shia, be it in Iraq, be it in Nigeria. Samah to Sheikh. Imam Al-Akbar, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Tayyib, uh, the Imam of uh, Al-Azhar Sharif, who for us Sunni Muslims is the head of Sunni Islam, if you want to call it, in the world. He clearly said that Shiaism, if you want to call it Ja'afri fiqh, it's like a fifth school of thought within uh, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. He, that's how far he went. Similarly to what Sayyid Sistani said, that don't call the Sunnis your brothers. I mean, unfortunately, they are from ourselves. So what I'm saying is one thing that I object to is that concept of cursing. Dr. Bojani very eloquently said, and this is something I advocate a lot, is one of the unique qualities, and this is someone who has studied history, I'm a student of history. If you look at Imam Ali, alayhi salam's life, if you look at the message, the ultimate message is the Prophet wasallam. If you look at his seerah, if you look at the way he behaved with uh, the Quraysh, if you look at the way he behaved with the enemies of Islam, and then, uh, obviously, Imam Ali was his, was his uh, protege, if you want to call it, his, his main student, and the rest of the Sahaba, and even Imam, uh, Imam Hassan al Hussein. One of the unique qualities that Montgomery Watts mentions is the distinction between these people and other people were due to courtesy and akhlaq and etiquettes. The behavior of Rasulullah, that when they spat at him, look at the way he behaved in return to them. In fact, people became Muslims due to the behavior of the Messenger of Allah. That is why Sayyidah Aisha said in Bukhari, which is narrated by Sa'ad bin Musayyib, that his character was the Quran. He was the living Quran. I believe Imam Hussein was the living Quran. Imam Ali was the living Quran in his interpretation. So when we see their akhlaq, their behavior, like Sheikh Bujani mentioned, the narration in Najul Balagha about the, the, the Battle of Sifin, Imam Ali stopping his companions from cursing the people. I think this is a major problem and it must be condemned. It must be stopped by everyone, not just, uh, not just uh, words, but efforts must be made that you should omit these types of wording within your ziyara. If you have confirmed and within your four or five day program, you have acknowledged that these ziyarat and these awrad or, or wird or whatever they may be, are not directly from the Aimma, are not from the 12 Imams, are not from Imam al Hussein, are not from Imam Ali, are not from them, but were things that were introduced which are acceptable. I accept that, that concept that everything is acceptable, everything is halal until the Quran uh, prohibits it. We, we don't, for, uh, in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the predominant view of us, uh, which uh, Imam Sarakshi mentions, is that we don't follow this concept that everything is, har everything, uh, is haram. No. It's halal until the text proves, proves uh, it otherwise. So yes, you have rituals uh, that, for example, are not from the Quran and Sunnah directly per se, but are they permissible? That's the question. And people partake in that. So we must stop that cursing. Number two, in the subcontinent, if you speak to people like Sheikh Abdul Hadi maybe uh, knows this, and people like my mother, my grandfather, my, my, my elders, they will tell you that in those days, there was peace and tranquility between all communities. That when Ziyarat al Ashura took place, when the Shias were commemorating the days of Imam al Hussein, the Sunnis at the same time were also commemorating the days of Imam Hussein. So, what I would condemn at this time are those Sunni people, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hadi mentioned about these people in Karachi. Let me make uh, a, 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 a very uh, uh, paramount point here is these individuals reacted to certain Zakirin. Uh, who, for example, cursed the, the Khulafa. And this ended up uh, a multi-march with multi-organizations and people coming together. In fact, Sipa Sahaba, a terrorist organization that is responsible for killing people, were also there. On the platform in Islamabad and in other places, 
uh, certain so-called Sunnis, I call them, were shouting and praising Yazid and Shimr and those people that were the murderers of the Ahlul Bayt. And this is a major problem. Again, we have to condemn within Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The Shias need to stop this cursing. They have to stop this hatred. They have to stop this conspiracy theory that all the Muslims, the Sunni Muslims, uh, adhere to one way. We have such diversity within Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. I would also say, which is extremely important, which uh, I never heard Dr. Imran's presentation, I apologize, but I got the gist of it. If you study Ilm al Kalam, you realize that the first group within the Muslims who had a formulated standard form of dogma creed were the Qadriya. It was not Ahl Sunnah, it wasn't the Shias. The Shias developed their creed much later. The, one of the earliest you know, debatable is the Qadriya. In fact, uh, Abu Mansur al Baghdadi in, in his book Al Usul al Deen, he gives a comprehensive a uh, background overview of the Qadriya. So the Shias were not as what we call an Usuli, a theological group at that time. They developed much later. So I do believe a lot of their dogma, a lot of the things that they have added, have been added for number one, because they have an identity crisis. And the reason for that was because they never realized how do we, where do we put ourselves? How do we balance ourselves? Are we Shiani Ali? Are we Shiani Muawiyah? Are we Shiani of the Khulafa? What this identity crisis did take place within the first two to three hundred years of the Muslim war. For example, Kufa. If you look at Kufa as a city in which Dr. Kumail mentioned, and I would humbly disagree with Dr. Kumail on this point, which is uh, Kufa was, was founded in 17 after Hijri by Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, and he established that has a uh, has a military strategical area where the Muslim armies could go from there. It was more close to the city and so forth. The vast majority of the people of that place were not Shia. They, Shiaism as a theological group did not exist. There were Sahaba, there were uh, normal Muslims, uh, and hence the reason why that propaganda we have from Sunnis that say that the Shias wrote these letters, I reject that. These letters could not, by definition, be written by Shias because they did not exist. So I think we have to have a, a, real, a really good debate. We have to have a theological debate. But to our Shia brothers, I think you have to, you have to uh, make way, you have to compromise uh, in the sense that you have to realize as much as you love Imam al Hussein and you honor Hussein and, and his forefathers, we have that same love, but we also have high admirance for people like Abu Bakr and Umar and the Khulafa and the Prophet's wives. And if we are going to have majalis and we're going to have programs where mm. you will be uh, you know uh, using provocative terminology at the same time sunni using provocative terms like saying shimmer a'udhu billah zindabad or yazid zindabad uh, yani, uh, in trying to give a dig towards the shias i think this is going to cause something which uh, will be uh, you know uh, a, a great catastrophe in pakistan and i think the only way to move forward is for you to remove these certain uh, lines from your from your from your ziyarat i'm not saying stop your ziyarat you have every right to do it you have every right for the arba'in and i think sunnis should also take part in the arba'in last point i would mention when i spoke uh, three years ago with uh, ayatullah murtada qazmini from karbala he mentioned something quite unique to me he said in his days which was the 1950s and the 1940s, he says it was a habit for Sunnis to take part in Arba'een and for the Shia Ayatullah, not the Shia Zakirin, not the Shia scholars, but the Ayatullahs to visit Imam Azam's mosque in Baghdad and to take and to uh, yani have an inter-religious dialogue and attend the Mawlid. So yani, there's a lot of issues I can say, but ultimately it is the issue about cursing and swearing. You need to do something about it, my dear brothers. And, and, and we also need to do something from ourselves regarding the takfir that is coming from our arena and the false allegations that we say regarding our brothers. Now, these are just my uh, thoughts or perceptions. Thank you Thank so you. much, dear Sheikh. Now, you've brought out certain very interesting points. 
Now, I want to draw on all of them at some point, but very briefly now, because our time is swiftly running out. However, I just want to quickly go, yes, Dr. Bojani, and I'll quickly go to Dr. Imran. Oh, sorry, Sheikh, I just, just very, very briefly. You know, I think um, Sheikh Omar's ethic is one which is to be applauded, you know, encouraged. He's been at the forefront of, um, you know, encouraging Shia Sunni dialogue here in the UK and across the world. But I think we should be careful about the way we're using terminology. Um, you know, even in our historical analysis, are the standards by which he's saying that Shias didn't exist at that time, the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah didn't exist as well. So I, I really don't want to get into polemics, but we, I think we should, you know, we should, we should be careful about that. And um, because otherwise it gives a mis, it gives a, you know, it can again cause insensitivities in the listener and we need, we need to have, we need to have appropriate balance. But his ethic is one which is absolutely to be applauded. You know, uh, thank you for that. But uh, Sheikh Umar did say they weren't Shia, they were just Muslim and normal Sahaba, normal people. Mm. He didn't say that they were Sunni either. Sure, you know? but it's just to emphasize that because it, it, it could come across to the listener, it could okay. come across to the listener that it's, the Shias didn't exist. No, okay. okay. And, and actually, they sometimes Shias feel very, very um, hurt by this. It might, they may not need to be, you know, yeah. okay, the, the, but, um, the, the Sunni hegemony, you know. I mean, I think that's too insensitive of, of Shias, but I thought it was worth us just flagging up. But I, I would just put one comment. I, I, I concur with what Dr. Bujani is saying, but what I'm trying to, the point I was trying to make with Sheikh Arif, uh, reiterate, I also mentioned that Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah has a dogma, has a theological school, has an identity that this is what we believe in, did not exist. We only had one type of understanding, which was we were all Muslims. And predominantly, if you look at our books, Shia or Sunnis, you were either Shiani Ali or Shiani Muawiyah. These were the two. This is when the uh, this this is when the two groups, if you want to call it, uh, uh, came uh, came came around. But again, my, what what my point of saying is is equally as much as the Shias have to look at themselves and look at their own identity, we have to we have an identity crisis, and we have to also look at it and how to uh, apply it in this modern world. Thank you, Doctor Kumail. Did you want to say something before I actually move on to Doctor Imran and ask him something? No, so I, I just, uh, Dr. Eliza has, has mentioned that point. Okay. Okay. Imran, I, 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 I take the point fully that all of you are concurring, we should be one. Sheikh Umar also said that Shia Jafari school has been acknowledged as the legitimate fifth school of fiqh amongst the Sunni scholars. And we want to move towards that. But I want to ask everybody here, beginning with you, and very brief answers. Is it possible to reconcile, bring about not only tolerance, but appreciation, harmonious coexistence, whilst we have such deep divisive issues amongst ourselves? Do you think it is at all possible to call for unity without maturely discussing these divisive issues in a scholarly academic fashion and putting them to rest? Well, it's a fascinating discussion, there's no doubt. And this can go off on many tangents. The original topic was to see the, the origins, the, 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 where, did, where did these morning uh, rituals, where did they originate from? What was the reason behind this? And I think we slightly digress. It doesn't mean the conversation isn't of quality and value, which it certainly is. We've slightly digressed from that question and that focus. But in direct answer or in direct response to what you're all asking here, I think, look, we have to be optimistic. That's the first thing that we have to remember. We have to be optimistic. Why? Because as Muslims, we are facing certain global, and I keep saying this, existential threats, and ideologically, not, not just as human beings, but ideologically, we are facing them. And I don't need to go into that. I think you're well aware of the current global situation, the different actors that are at play, and what their intentions are. The Middle East is inflamed. It's moving towards South Asia. There are continuous political undercurrents, which are looking to, and as you've seen Pakistan, trying to raise those tensions and, and, and really burn the house down, so to speak. But I think due to still good ulama, balanced ulama, who can see the situation from a unemotional, undetached position almost, who have kept the peace. So moving forward, what I would say is this, education is the key. We, I suppose, as scholars, as alims, of course, yourselves, 
we have to slightly go above our sensibilities. We have to be able to discuss the situation, especially the Islamic tradition, from a slightly balanced point of view, which means we have to challenge and look at our own tradition. So as Sheikh Umar said so brilliantly, really, which is, yes, you're right, even the Sunni position wasn't fully materialized till the 13th century. This wasn't until the Ayyubids took over Cairo did the Sunni four schools were established properly. Before that, there were five to 600 schools. This is documented. The notion of the Jafri school was one of those schools. So it so happens that after the Ayyubids defeat the Ismailis in Cairo, and then take over. They establish their position, they establish their identity at a very difficult time because of the Crusades, the Mongols, internal problems. So we see the formation of a tradition at that time. Then the Jafri school later on becomes, of course, an established tradition in its own right, as we see it today. But it's really a proto movement before that. Now, in saying that, this shouldn't really, we shouldn't really feel that we are impacting or we are hurting the sensibilities of people because the time has come now that we must rise slightly above them and we start we need to almost educate re-educate ourselves in terms of our tradition and only by sitting down and discussing these rather sensitive points can we come can we come to some sort of agreement on what is an acceptable platform therefore develop the forums such as this, not only here in the UK, but across the world. Because what we'll do then is we'll start to take history apart from both angles. We'll start to question some of the narratives which are spurious. If you look at, you know, if we, if we look at what um, you know, has been said, of course, th there's a whole period between the sort of 12th to 16th century where there's this movement, of, you know, there's a Sufiistic movement coming in, empires are changing, new powers are coming in. So there are many different influences. So going back to the original question of where these morning rituals come from, the establishment of, I suppose, a very identifiable, a very sort of Persian orientated movement gives rise to what we now see, I suppose, in sort of Shia Islam. And this is not trying to offend or hurt anybody. This is sharing an opinion. This could be wrong. This could be right. This could be better informed. We're not denying that point. But historically, looking at the text and the writings from both sides, we're seeing quite clearly that this is a movement which comes later on. Okay. And so, this cursing, this absolute denigration of each other's fates, this is something which comes just before colonialism, into colonialism, it really builds up. And now the manifestation in the current so 20th, 21st century is we've almost come to a loggerhead. So my, I suppose, final point here is we need to re-educate ourselves by establishing a platform upon which we can debate which doesn't offend either side. And that means that we have to rise as human beings and scholars above our own sensibilities to be able to question our own beliefs. This is known as religiosity. What is the value of our religiosity? Are we informed people? Are we open to discussion? Or are we foreclosed and we will hold our opinions forever? So from the Sunni side, there's always this question of fear. Am I talking to somebody with an with an open, authentic opinion? Or are they doing something to pacify the situation while holding on and retaining their own beliefs, which are steeped in their own historical tradition and narrative, which may or may not be authentic, according to what I'm a form of, as a Sunni, for example. So until we can reach the point where we can debate these points, not be offended, and not feel the urge to be victorious or have one, one upsmanship on each other, until that point, I don't think it's viable for us to reach any sort of reconciliation. But having said that, and having seen the you know, platforms such as this being established with scholars of such, I suppose, um, credibility and, um, and, and, and such you know, knowledge and, and, and etiquette and you know, all the other things that come with having discussions such as this, um, we won't be able to move forward, I don't think. But having seen this, I think there is great positivity in this. I think there's great potential. And I see great hope, actually, going forward, especially with some of the work that Sheikh Umar Ramadan's been doing and yourself, Sheikh Arif. I think um, that there is hope definitely going forward. But we must take this step by step. This is the first sort of steps we're taking. I think the next steps will involve us actually unpicking and unpacking the tradition itself. And then I think there is hope going forward because once the ulama and once the scholars and once the leaders are able to hold dialogue and unify on single platforms, and I think at this moment, forgive me, but the political platform is probably our, probably our most pertinent issue at the moment. We must unify on that level to unify the people and then the dialogue and theology and religion and history can begin. But until we reaffirm our common shared values and our common shared heritage and then our common shared 
future goals in terms of our you know, survival and in terms of what the future holds for us as Muslims, um, we won't be able to make that start. But I do see this as a very positive platform. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Imran. I'm going to actually follow that through with something else yeah. with uh, Sheikh Abdul Hadi. Um, Sheikh, you said that we believe in one God, in the finality of the Prophet, in the same revelation. That is our identity and that marks our essential identity as Muslim. I'm asking you to give a very blunt and an open answer. Do you feel that shared identity, belief in God and the Quran and the Prophet, is enough for now to bring us as one people and we give the undertaking of discussing our differences gradually with the progression of time? But for now, we can unite on this basis. The reason why I'm asking this is that the Muslims refuse to pray with each other. Is the belief in one God, the Prophet, and the Quran enough at this point in time to bring us together? And then we can gradually, in a scholarly fashion, discuss our differences and find some resolution. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, this uh, gathering, like uh, one of the signs, that we can unite for common terms and for common goals. So this is one of the uh, example for that. If you organize similar program, uh, so inshallah we can hope to bring peace and harmony in the society. And we have common terms more than uh, whatever has been said by our uh, learned scholars and ulama. So we have common terms like Tawheed, Risalat, Akhirat, which are like a article of faith. This is very important and about Salat as well. So we have, we all agreed only five times Salat is obligatory upon believer, male and female, five times they have to pray. And 17 rakats as a first, no difference between Sunni and Shia, they all agreed only 17 rakat are first. Then Sunnat or Nawafil as much as you can, but Farz is only 17 rakat. And also we all believe that we have to fast during the month of Ramadan. Not a single Shia who is saying that, no, we have, we have to fast during the month of Shawwal or Shaban. We all agree this. And similarly, Hajj. Hajj is Farz in Zul Hijjah and all Shia and Sunni, they travel to perform Hajj during this specific time. So we have common terms, but because of, as I said, some wise and some zakir, they uh, highlighted some issues which not relating to directly our aqidah and iman. That's, I, that's why I raised this question, is this part of our iman to swear our curse to companion, our wives of the Prophet? No, not at all. Not a single alim who is a reliable alim from Shia school of thought, he can support for this. And similarly, is this possible for a person who believes that he is a Sunni and he disregard to uh, the uh, Ahlul Bayt? It is not impossible. It is not possible for any Sunni to uh, humiliate or to even istighfaf or tanqis to degrade them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved their high status. So no one can damage this. So uh, I think we have, mashallah, common terms more than what we are talking. So inshallah ta'ala, we can hope for this. But condition is that we have to understand each other and we have to address uh, in sensible way, inshallah. Thank you. So this now leads to the very final point because we've run out of time and the added time. So now what I'm getting from here is that there is diversity. Diversity within human existence is inevitable. It's an existential feature of our human worldly existence. This diversity can come under the banner of Islam through the worship of one God. However, what I'm seeing from my Sunni colleagues is that there is a red line. If that red line is crossed, this diversity cannot harmoniously coexist. If we do not cross that red line, then we are hopeful that diversity can prevail within the ambit of this beautiful unity of Islam. That red line 
is the swearing and cursing feature of the faith. I'm asking from the Shia panelists here, is it at all possible that that can be omitted? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was muted. So yeah, of course it is possible uh, in two ways. Uh, number one, um, redefining, um, I would rather say, going back to the original meaning of tabarri, uh, which was to dissociate oneself from uh, those actions which Quran has prohibited uh, and the Prophet has prohibited. So instead of cursing someone, um, you need to dissociate yourself from the work which that individual whom you want to curse leave the, those work and, and show in practice instead of cursing it. So I, I don't think so there is any position of like, you know, this bashing or this cursing and this swearing that is not condoned by the Imams. And I have a firm belief that if Imams swear now, the, the construction, the framework, the understanding of Imam, which I have in my mind, or like, you know, great scholars have in my mind, that is not, that image is not consistent with bashing and cursing and swearing and that sort of thing. That's number one. Number two, as far as omitting is concerned, certainly it's possible. Um, and I can go to example, uh, back in early 20th century, uh, late 20th century, uh, ziyarats were being published, right? But without that sort of land of khulafa. So at um, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Umar Ramadan has, has mentioned, uh, we should be omitting this. And that was the practice which was there. And as uh, Dr. Imran mentioned, like, you know, after colonial period, you, you, you find this sort of like, you know, inter-Muslim issues. But in, in early days, they used to sit together harmoniously reciting Ziyarat without those uh, elements of like, you know, which is creating disunity. So that's the, the first example. Second example, one of my uh, the scholars, like one of my, my whom I respect, he says like whenever he recites among the Shi'i community, not personally, among the Shi'i community, he just doesn't include this lanat and this cursing of the khulafa stuff because that is not which Shiism should believe in. So uh, on an optimistic note, what Maulana Abdul Hadi and Dr. Imran uh, has suggested, yes, there is a huge opportunity um, and that needs to come from the Shi'i side and, and scholars needs to be reminded time and again, the repercussion of this behavior and a loss of lives, which we see across the globe. So uh, I would have a humble request from our Sunni colleagues to keep this dialogue open, to remind scholars within Sunni school of thought, as well as Shias, to highlight because many a times scholars are in their cocoon within their own community and they don't realize how our Sunni scholars and Sunni communities feel when these issues are brought up, they are hurt. And this is not something which Ayyumar has advocated. So I have a humble plea and request as well to keep the dialogue open, remind time and again to Shi scholars about mm -hmm. these repercussions. Uh, Dr. Ali, do you want to say something in the last 30 seconds before I wrap up? I, I think to echo the comments which have gone before. Um, so education is key, dialogue is key, Yet yeah, this um, dropping of cursing and, um, you know, abusive language, of course it's possible. If it incites hatred, then it's necessary. And we see that it is inciting hatred. Okay, so keeping this dialogue is important. But finally, you know, as has been mentioned, you know, diversity doesn't need uniformity. And I think Shias have a problem with differences of opinion amongst themselves. Sunnis have a problem with differences of opinion amongst themselves. Okay, and overall, we have to get past this problem with difference of opinion, especially when so quickly Muslims are ready to go to takfir, okay, ready for the spilling of blood. So I think both comments which have been made across the board, okay, I would um, absolutely endorse that we need to pull back these practices, speak together and learn from each other. So I conclude from this and I thank my learned panelists. May Allah bless you all. Jazakumullah khaira that Imam Hussein, far from being a point of contention and diversity and disunion, he is a point of union, a point of reconciliation, a point of coming together and aspiring to the loftier aims of humanity. All schools of thought revere and respect Imam Hussein and the Ahlul Bayt. Similarly, 
all schools of thought need to respect the noble companions of the Prophet, the blessed wives of the Prophet. Similarly, there are differences of opinion, and differences of opinion are an existential future of our existence. We can never stop differences. We can live with those differences under the shared essential identity of being muwahideen, believing in Quran, and having the same practices as Muslims. Also, there is one little issue that uh, sometimes our Sunni brothers point out, and that is that some of the mourning practices adopted by the Shia faith are not reflecting positively on the Shias or the Shia faith. Maybe the Shias need to think on that. On the flip side, the Shias are saying the Sunnis need to be a bit more tolerant of our expression and our sentiment of grief and the way we reveal ourselves and articulate our grief. But we all agree we need more dialogue and to discuss these issues further and to come to a better understanding. With that, I bid you all farewell and in the peace of God and in the protection of God. Wassalamu alaikum, jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.